not being funny, but it's amazing how well this has all been organised for the Queen. But when it comes to COVID, yeah. it's a complete and utter muck. Apparently, yeah. it's twice a year they were prepping for the Queen's funeral really? to all be orchestrated. And COVID and all the preparations for a pandemic was once every six. Gosh. It's just got the priorities all over the place, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. How does that how does that work? Why are we not like I think Dominic Cummings also said, God knows what we're gonna do when there's a solar flare. Like uh, he said yeah. that in committee, and you're sort of going, Now I wanna know what the mm -hmm. plans are if we get hit by a solar flare. But of course, you can't find anything because there are no plans for a solar flare. Like it's a choice of well, well, you can also just deny that there are solar flares and then that's the <laughs> Like don't look up. <laughs> I always think of Cummings as, uh, he, he, always, he strikes me a bit like the Joker, you know, there's that line, you know, some men just want to watch the world burn. He just sort of, he's just, yeah, I feel like with Brexit, he was just sort of more interested if he could do it than if, uh, mm. you know, and how to do it to sort of, uh, I will cover that one later. <laughs> Which politician would you choose to take on the Joker? I'm going to throw that over to Simon. Which politician would you choose to take on the Joker? Uh, well, we've touched on it already, but I think it'd have to be Dominic Cummings because he sort of reminds me of the Joker himself, you know. Some men just want to watch the world burn. He's a chaos merchant, so it would be very <laughs> interesting to see how they'd go off against each other. Do you, would, you, would you feel like a law and order person wouldn't be able to take on the might of the Joker? Do we have a law and order person? <laughs> um... I, I don't know why. That's why it's why it'd be interesting, wouldn't it? It would just be the uh, battle of ideas. Dominic Cummings, is, is yeah. Dominic Cummings, the law and order person. He, he's I not very good at following from, uh... laws himself, is he? No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was from Beetlegeist, wasn't he? According to Spinning Image. <laughs> oh yeah. That is yeah, one of the funniest read minds. things. Yeah, he can read minds. So this is what you call a baby. Um, yes, it looks delicious. May I eat it? <laughs> Jolly good. Uh, afraid not. Uh, uh, Carrie would be furious. Then I shall not do that. Instead, I shall eat some of your earth snacks. <laughs> oh, I was like that depiction of Pretty Patel as the, uh, the vampire. Uh, Miss Patel, we refugees have been waiting so long. When do we go to Great Britain? When you can name every English monarch, earn £30 million a year, and drink 15 pints of Stella and still drive. <laughs> she could be quite, quite good. So I'm going to throw it over to Michael. But Michael, I'm going to give you three choices. Yeah. You've got Pretty Patel. Yep. Boris Johnson. Yes. Dominic Raab. Who would you use to throw at the Joker? Who do you well, think would have the most success? I was hoping you would include uh, the lovely, fragrant um, Sue Ella. I mean, she's um, she <laughs> she's sent them off to she sent them off to Antarctica or somewhere or hanging <laughs> Rwanda. <laughs> Rwanda, yes, <laughs> I, I full up. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, of those three, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think, think Boris Johnson. Any of them he, Boris Johnson would get it wrong, wouldn't he? He'd sort of send it the wrong place, or, or he'd have, <laughs> he had something else to do on, 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 on that day. Who would the other? Johnson? So, you probably promote him into the cabinet. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Or give him the new codes. He could buy his way out very easily. Yeah. <laughs> Who were the so, others? So you would go with Suella then? I definitely, yes. I don't think there's anybody more um more unpleasant than her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Max. So to to counter the Joker, you need a Batman. So when when we first when you first mentioned this, my my first idea my first idea came into my mind was um, Jacob Rees Mogg, but he's more like a butler. What was what was Batman's uh, butler called? Uh, Alfred. 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 Yeah. So Jacob Rees Mogg would be, would be more like an Alfred. Uh, <laughs> uh, so who would be Batman? Mark Francois? No, I'm not sure <laughs> because he talked about climbing up. You know, uh, wasn't he talking about climbing? Big Ben to bong Boy. bong for Brexit. So although he didn't do it, but he he was suggesting he would do it. So he could be like a Batman figure. We will leave the European Union at 11 p.m. GMT on the 31st of January. As we leave at a precise specified time, those who wish to celebrate will need to look to a clock to mark the moment. 
It seems inconceivable to me and many colleagues that that clock should not be the most iconic timepiece in the world, Big Ben. That Big Ben should bong for Brexit. Standing up on the top of uh, Big Ben overlooking the city, making sure that Brexit gets done or... <laughs> the reason for this face is the image of Marc Francois like, being pushed into the bat suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's Pen Penfold was, uh, was a Danger Mouse's uh, sidekick, so he has some, maybe he has some experience of that. It's not very I nice always image. thought he looked like Peter Griffin. <laughs> I, I just every time I see him is Peter Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody to another Sunday roast. So Cecil lineup of guests. We have track record. Simon, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh hi there. Um so my name's Simon. I run a YouTube channel called The Track Record. Uh I do lots of Vox style geopolitical explainer type videos with lots of cool map animations. Uh, so if that's something you might be interested in checking out, then I'm sure it'll be linked in the description. And Michael? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Michael Lambert, and uh, I I'm just an old bloke who rants a bit, really. I started off uh, ranting about Brexit uh, 18 months ago, and for some reason or other, I'm still doing it. But uh, I think I'm going to be kept busy for a while. It pays the bills, doesn't it? <laughs> well, some of them. <laughs> 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 I wonder if it'll get to a point where YouTube can't actually even afford to pay your own electric bill. That'll be, that'll be an irony. <laughs> and uh, Max? Hi, guys. I'm Max here. I uh, run the Robespierre channel. Uh, talk about British politics and Brexit in particular. And yourself, Alex? I'm Political X. I'm an historian, author. Let's get straight on into it. Brexit. How's it all going, Michael? What do you think? How's, how's Brexit treating you these days? It's, it's going wonderfully. It's giving me plenty of material. That's the main thing. Um, <laughs> it's a complete and utter disaster. And it's, uh, I, I think it's such an irreversible disaster. It seems to me all these ideas about going back in and so on are, are not going to happen for years. And in the meantime, I think we're just, we're just uh, destined to have an economy just uh, getting worse and worse. I, I, I think the economy is doomed really at the moment. It's, it's, it's so bad. And at the same time, of course, we're a worldwide laughingstock. And I think this government have absolutely no idea whatsoever what to do, because it's almost impossible to, to, to make things better. And they talk about going for growth and all this nonsense. I mean, it's just, it just isn't going to happen. Yeah, Brexit's pretty, pretty desperate, I think. I do. I wonder if with the, the, the long, long term, how Brexit will play out. Uh, I think once we've got this government removed and... You know, because they're, they're fanatics, they're fanatical about Brexit and it's become this almost sort of religious idea that it, it's this uninsultable idea. Um, but I think I think that will gradually fade away. And I reckon over the next three decades or so, we might slowly gravitate basically a Switzerland style arrangement. You know, I think we will sort of be kind of partially integrating into the single market through just a, a series of integral deals, because... It's the simple fact of geography. They are our closest neighbour. They are always going to be the majority of our trades. The simple market forces will dictate that the economy will benefit under a closing, closer trading relationship to them. Once all the dogma has gone away, I, I do think that over a long period of time, we will slowly shift to that kind of arrangement, I hope. The point of Brexit was to make everything cheaper. But of course, it was to uh, increase our exports. But we've then put red tape up against our local neighbours. I, it just can't work, can it? Max, what, what are your thoughts? Well, there, there's, there are two interesting things about it, um, and it re it's somewhat related to just what you said about red tape. I uploaded a video this morning where somebody was in a, in a station, it could have been the Eurostar station in London, but there was, um, you know, these electronic billboards, and it was just a slideshow, and it was actually put up there. It's an advertisement for UK businesses to relocate to Belgium. So there's a a region in Belgium, which is inviting businesses from Britain to, to relocate there. And they're talking about how there's it's much easier to, to export. It's much easier to, there's less red tape, uh, shorter transit times, things like this. So you have a region in Belgium advertising to businesses in Britain about moving to Belgium. So this, of course, is a benefit for Belgium. You have, you create jobs there. They will pay taxes to the exchequer there. And I said in the video, I said, J show this to your Brexiteer friends and ask them, is there an equivalent in Britain where the, the town council is inviting businesses from Europe to set up in, in Britain? No, because there's no incentive for them. We but, could talk about pre-ports. Yeah. And it's, that might be the exception. 
Yeah. But, but, that, all... but that's more about businesses already existing in Britain moving to the free ports. What happened to the Brexit opportunities minister? Remember, there was a Brexit opportunities minister. Jacob Rees-Mogg was that minister. Um, and Liz Truss closed down the the ministry, the department. I, th- I think he'd found all the all the benefits. Ah, okay. <laughs> so the painting, the painting, it got it got Brexit opportunities done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and okay. and, and uh, much more powerful vacuum cleaners. <laughs> can't sell to Europe. <laughs> well, we can't sell to Europe. Absolutely, yes. Can't sell to Europe. Like... <laughs> well, that was number two on the list, wasn't it? In the, the Sun did an article listing Brexit benefits, and yeah. number two was vacuum cleaner wattage i didn't yeah i didn't see boris johnson driving around the country with that written on a bus yeah. <laughs> we send 900 watts vacuum cleaners to the eu every week we should have all the watts for ourselves just a serious point on that is it's it's about uh, efficiency not wattage see it's not about increasing the, like there's no benefit increasing the wattage if the inf- if the efficiency goes down which is mm. something interesting about electric cars you know we hear about you know the this car has certain range what what they've started to do is focus more on the efficiency the kilowatt usage per kilometer or mile instead of actually just the amount of wattage or kilowatts you can put into a battery and the same with the vacuum cleaner you know there's no point in having a you know, a one megawatt vacuum you know, or whatever, you know, you don't need that, but also it loses efficiency the more you, the more you increase the wattage. And if you're moving away from EU standards, which are the world standard, because countries outside the EU also use EU standards because they're the best. If you're moving away from that, then you're going to end up with less efficient uh, equipment. I just had a picture of the red bus being like a Henry Hoover. <laughs> Because that's oh. only red and black as well, isn't it? And I could also imagine if you if you really wanted to propel Brexit forward, you could easily have Boris sat on that and it pushing him along because of the extra <laughs> the oh, extra man. power. More power. <laughs> on the um, on the topic of free ports, I mean it it was one of the classic Brexit pieces of misinformation is hurrah Brexit, we can now do free ports. But we had free ports for quite a long time in this country. I think I think they got rid of most of them in 2012. Yeah. Uh, don't quote me on that. But yeah, so it's just sort of bringing back an old idea and sort of marketing it as a Brexit benefit, even though it's nothing to do with Brexit. Plenty so of we... European countries have free ports. So why did they get rid of them? They got rid of them because it didn't do much and it actually dragged stuff out of the town centres. It was just like tax incentives. Very similar to what the plan now is very similar to what they're doing with the bankers' bonuses. It'll be for the rich. It'll be also for the Mafia. So one of the things I found out you could do, uh, which is interesting, um, let's say you've got a lovely piece of artwork and you want to sell it over to China. You could go and put it into the free port. And then technically, once it's in the free port, it's in transit. And let's say this piece of art is worth, I don't know, like a million quid. Because it's already in transit, you then make the sale. You then send an order to the person in the warehouse to ship out the product. You then don't pay tax because the product was already in transit. And so what you'll find is stuff like that going on, which means we've lost tax on like antiques and valuable equipment. But also you'll just find these will be turning into like storage houses where you'll just go and store your money. And part of the advantage of storing it or or your goods or your cars or anything of value, and it'll just be left there to to stay in the warehouse. But the, the other important thing for you is if you're particularly concerned about being investigated by the police or maybe the FBI or Interpol or any other big police agencies, you're going to be finding that you can hide your stuff in there and it's very difficult for them to get access to it because there won't be particular records and you'll need a special warrant to be able to go in and get access. This has all happened in Switzerland. The Swiss went nuts over it because they were going, this is clearly like turned into a mafia den where like the rich and, and the powerful are like, hiding all their stuff and the police can't get access and they're still having problems with this in in switzerland i think it's in geneva the free port so to me i'm just like it's again it's that trickle down economics that they're obsessed with and even even the brexit economic policy which is quite interesting essentially their plan is to borrow a load of money to get us out of this recession and drop the tax i don't know of an economic policy where that's worked and the only one that i know that got us out of the last recession was in the states in the 70s and I think he increased interest rates and cut production of cash. And basically, it just knackered the economy. 
which is almost exactly, uh, and the point of that is then it resets the economy, which I think is exactly what the Bank of England are trying to do, except Liz Truss doesn't agree with the Bank of England. So you've got the two sides colliding. But well, like the EU is trying to, it has been cracking down on free ports for the last number of years, because mm. as you say, and as you pointed out, they, they can be used for money laundering activities and all sorts of uh, criminal activity as well. So yeah, as you said, you can put something in the free port and it can't be checked. I, I don't know if this is true or not, but um, maybe it's more related to these charter cities. Free ports are run by private companies they're not run yep. by the state or is i'm not sure if that's true oh yeah you know the well, guys who run the pno who, who did the fire and rehire fire did whatever the tannoy didn't they they're just sort of like attentional staff <laughs> this is your last <laughs> last shift the company has made the decision that its vessels going forward will be primarily crewed by a third party crew provider therefore i am sorry to inform you that this means your employment is terminated with immediate effect on the grounds of redundancy. Your final day of employment is today. Wow. Absolutely horrendous. So the guys that own p and they're now on the board of two free ports in the UK. So it's like, we've just rewarded people despite all the bad behavior. I, that often happens, doesn't it? I mean, you, you, you do something wrong and that, that's very quickly forgotten if there's a financial interest in the future. But these free ports, as I understand it, they enable you to import stuff and you don't pay any duty or VAT until the stuff leaves the port. Is that not the idea? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you've then got an option, haven't you? You can then send the product to somewhere else. Yeah. Yes. And, and then you've saved in theory some money or yes. you can then go through the barriers. But that, there's, there's an issue with that as well, because the borders are going to be run by private security. Are they? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's in all the free ports. There's going to be nothing that's... left to privatise soon. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what Liz Truss is running into already. She's trying to be yeah. Margaret Thatcher 2.0, but oh. there's not much left to sell on <laughs> Channel 4. And, you know, BBC? Yeah, I, well... M1? I'm, I'm sure they'd be quite happy to start taking an axe to the BBC because the... What, did you watch? Did you watch Emily Maitlis's, um speech at the Edinburgh Fringe? Yes. Yeah. That yeah. was fascinating, mm. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there was a particular lie there where she said, you know, we throughout our strive to be so rigidly impartial with Brexit. You know, we, you'd spend an hour and find 50 economic experts who told you Brexit was a bad idea and one who thought it was a good idea. But then you just put one of each on, yeah. on the radio show and, and they're sort of pitched as, you know, equal and opposing ideas. Very good at, uh, they're very good at avoiding mentioning Brexit at the BBC. You hardly ever hear it at all. But they're going to come into problems with that because they're going to have to do the exact same thing that they did with Brexit because there's, you know, I must be aware of about 20 rejoin groups. There's a rejoin EU party. So they're going to be able to go, well, you did this all with Brexit, so you've got to give us equal platform that you did with Nigel. I think he was on, what, question time 25 times? Yes, yes. Most ever. Like, with, with Nigel Farage and the BBC was very interesting. I don't remember who said it, but it was a very interesting take. What Farage did was he made himself always available. So, for example, you know, if we have our, our Sunday roast and, and Nigel Farage said, look, I'm always available, then we'd probably have him on a lot. And he, what he, <laughs> he, he, uh, if he, if he wants to come on, Nigel, you're welcome to come on. But, um, <laughs> Please he, do. <laughs> he what he did was he made himself always available. So whatever the topic was, it could be about climate change, it could be about the NHS. He would be on, and he would be able to use that as a platform to to sell Brexit. So the topic is the NHS waiting list. So he'd be saying, "Look, once we leave the EU, we're going to be able to uh, reduce these waiting lists. We're going to get, uh, you know get rid of all these foreigners who are clogging up the hospitals or whatever." This was a huge problem. This was a big problem because you had the BBC who would be looking for a guest uh, or looking for someone to talk about a particular topic. And Nigel Farage was always available. So if they couldn't find someone, they'd bring Nigel in. So that's why he was always on, because um, they didn't actually, they weren't able to get other guests on, which was a big problem because he, he obviously was there to sell his own type of uh, propaganda or his own type of ideology. No, I was going to say, I think I, I think much of the reason he was he was always on was because he's such such a good performer. Yeah, he's got the gift of the gab in the way that Trump and, and and Johnson have, and always interesting person too. And I think you know they want people to watch the program. Once he was on, everybody watched it. What's interesting is the the BBC would say we need to be impartial. We need to have both sides. So when it comes to climate change, we have a scientist, and when we have, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> an oil baron or whatever. What's interesting recently is that they they haven't applied this to the royal family. 
they haven't had mm. you know uh I was literally thinking that yeah yeah That's... they haven't had uh what do you call it um republican uh, well, yeah, but they'd have a, a pro-monarchist person, but they wouldn't have a Republican on. What, why is that the case? Would it be insensitive or considered insensitive? It just seems to be a bit of a, a, you know, an embargo at the moment on discussions about the monarchy. I mean, I'd, I'd argue that we, it's not about the Queen's death. It's about the appointment of a new king. You know, now actually is the time to, to discuss the monarchy as an institution. But I think it's just sort of... Maybe, sorry, I was going to say, maybe let the funeral uh, take place first. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe maybe next week there will be a big discussion, uh, I mean, or maybe perhaps, during the coronation. The, you see, this is where I'm I'm conflated because I'm almost like maybe actually the Queen should have stepped down and given it over to Charles, and then we wouldn't have this con uh, conflation of two major events at the same time. That's causing a lot of problems because the one that kid who got nabbed in Edinburgh, I, I I've said this repeatedly. I didn't agree with him shouting at a funeral procession. That was just nuts. But at the same time, I would still defend his right to freedom of speech. But there's also a really interesting nuance. What's to say that didn't distress him? Because Andrew has, from what we can tell, paid off 12 million over to Virginia Dufre to 20 million. That seems to be the, the two rumors. We don't know where the money's come from, and it could easily have come from the public purse, or it's come from the Crown Estate, but you know, we financed that in part. And so you're going, right, so the taxpayer's money has just paid him off. And, it, and during those interviews, he said, I've never met her. The photo's probably doctored. His lawyers then came out, like, in the build-up to the, the trial happening, just complete slander against Virginia Dufresne. Like, they were trying to find dirt on her and get it out into the papers and have it all published. And I'm sort of going, isn't that kid going to be distressed by seeing Andrew? So I'm going, the, the, the law that they had, uh, they, they've been using, for, and this is a great segue, by the way, guys. <laughs> You were obviously segueing into into the protest and the right to protest in the UK. And it's essentially it is it's freedom of speech and the right to protest versus the monarchy, which is which is something that shouldn't happen. And you know, have to put in my history hat and give historical context, because there's some important historical context here. Um, which which I think has been completely um uh, pushed to one side. But he, couldn't he be distressed by seeing Andrew walking around in the streets? And parading and, and and putting that onto on, onto the public, it's not like they they're keeping their heads down. But what they're saying is, we want to be able to go out and show ourselves in public, but you're not allowed to. You know, but like you can imagine it, uh, when Jimmy Savile was still alive, his victims would have seen him, you know, on TV, seen him in in the public domain, and obviously they were, you know, and I and there were people, as far as I know, before he died, protesting, in in a very small way, they were. They were ignored. You, Johnny Rotten, he did. He got onto the BBC and said, I know some dirty little secrets and it's not being discussed. And then he claims he was banned from the BBC for a decade because of that. And yet he was actually speaking the truth. And it's almost like, as, as we were saying earlier with the BBC, there's an element of bias. Like during the Jubilee, was there anyone? I, I don't know. I didn't really follow it, but... Was there anyone on there who was a Republican going, I don't think this is right? I didn't see much of that, I wouldn't say. But the issue here, surely, is the fact that you can now be arrested for shouting at Prince Andrew or by holding up a sign, as we've seen this last week. And that is truly terrifying. This is what happens in Red Square. And it's what yeah. happens in China. And I think this is, uh, this is something we should all be really concerned about. We are going towards a police state. And the government is taking more and more control. And someone like braver man in, uh, as home secretary I and mean, she's going to be really really tough and people are going to be afraid to go out and uh, and protest and you've only got to put away one or two like that woman holding a sign up but give her a, 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 a some sort of um, uh, a criminal sentence and uh, people are going to be terrified it's really frightening and i think it's really something we should all be concerned about unless people get out on the streets very very soon in huge numbers it's going to be too late well as i say something that's interesting about the the way they're doing this is that they're not actually using the police crime sentence in courts bill they're using the public order act which is a 1986 piece of legislation you know it's an it's an old law but the thing is is it's incredibly broad you know mm -hmm. it's, it's just sort of listed as um well, I think it's similar kind of language to the um, police and crime bill. It's, you know, sort of caused distress. It used to contain the words 
you know, insulting someone in there could be considered a crime. I think that was removed. But it's um, broad laws are a problem, you know, sort of undefined laws, because you can just sort of pick and choose how you apply it. And, you know, and, and that woman is a prime example. I mean, that, you know, there's one woman had the sign, not my king. I yeah. don't think that's a sign that could reasonably argue would cause harassment or distress, but they were still able to apply this law to detain her. Would it, do you think it would have applied if they said, long live the Republic? No. I think that's, that's very no, interesting. No, no, long, yeah, long, well, long live the Republic. A lot of those officers seem to have misread the law as well. It says likely, mm. likely to cause any of these things. Um, I think the law was built around the Stephen Lawrence case as well. So originally it was adapted to deal with racism. And now they've just sort of, as you said, it's so broad. And that's the problem with the law. And in many ways, it's the reason why we have courts, because they've got to go, well, actually, there's a nuance here. And this is the important of the ECHR. That's guaranteeing our freedom of speech. That's the only thing, probably, at the moment, that will probably protect any of those people that are being arrested. And they'll have to go to the courts and go, actually, he is entitled to say that, or she is entitled to say that. Well, Sorry, Michael, I can see you want to jump but, but, in. But there's, a, there's, a, there's a new bill going through Parliament, a new public order bill going through at the moment, which is going to give police the right to stop and search anybody going on a demonstration. It's going to give them the right to actually prohibit certain individuals from going on demonstrations and even to, to um, investigate and, uh, and limit internet access. Have a look at it. It's terrifying. And they're talking about uh, uh, putting on uh, tags to people who might want to go on demonstrations that they don't think should. So it, it's really draconian, these, these, these laws, particularly under this new bill. Wow. I, I guess they'll all be moving to Scotland at some point soon then. Mm. Apart from accident. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it, it says something just about how, because, you know, that I mean, it's more connected to the Rwanda policy, but, you know, all this talk about, oh, we're going to leave the ECHR. Two countries have ever left the ECHR. I think one was Greece during uh, the coup, and the other was Russia. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's the sort of the cohort of people that we're talk, talking about joining. You know, it's, it doesn't doesn't bode well but then also there's all this false conflation of the ECHR with the EU mm. they're not not remotely related to each other but that's one of our previous important. videos that we had was with uh, Tim Wilson and he actually went to the ECHR court to take on the Greek government for false imprisonment uh, and they won uh, and the ECHR demanded that the Greeks change their law because it was too draconian <clears throat> and it, they, they didn't change it which is also interesting because it shows the limitations, but they did pay in compensation for losing the court case. But it shows the importance of actually having a judicial system that is above, that is supernatural, mm. uh, above everyone who can go, well, wait a minute, this is our, this is a founding principle. In fact, Britain set this up. Freedom of speech is a core concept that has to be protected. I mean, the irony is the Conservative government were going balmy about taking away free speech inside university. And then have we heard Liz Druss come out and complain about this? I mean, she slagged off the monarchy like nothing else in her, in her 20s. She railed against them. And now she's flipped. I mean, you know, it's flip flat Liz, isn't it? She's, so she's, she's always she's... said whatever whatever has been convenient for her, to, for, for her, for her advancement, for her career. I think uh, she has no principles whatsoever. She's got no intellectual depth whatsoever. She's just a, just a, a, a lightweight. And uh, how she ever became prime minister is, is really quite... Quite astonishing, but <laughs> oh, saying, saying what they wanted to hear. <laughs> well, exactly, yes, yes. But, I mean, but even it, so, even so, with her background of being pro uh, pro Remain, I mean, it's extraordinary that she got through. But, mm. um, well, she just flipped on it hard. Yeah, the, yeah, the you yeah. know the minute the vote came in, pretty much, didn't she? Yes. You know, and it. But the, the other thing, I mean, she's. She's made a conscious decision to go down that route, isn't she? I yeah. mean, you know, Boris Johnson, you know, always occupied that sort of echelon. But, you know, she, she's very much decided to, to put what's best for the country aside and focus on what's best for Liz. Well, I, I, she knows that she, she has to keep the right wing of the Tory party happy. And, and, and that's that's or angry be priority. <laughs> or, or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, she's, going to, she's going to do and say whatever is going to please please the, the loonies on the right of the of the, of the Tory party, mm. who are really running the show, aren't they? I mean, them and uh, and all the people in Tufton Street or wherever it is. It's interesting yeah. as well because it's only at what one hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. And the rumor is that Richard Tice. It's only a rumor, allegation that Richard Tice sort of asked people from the Reform and UKIP parties to move into the Conservative Party to to change attitudes within it. It's really? clearly happened. 
Yeah, that's that's an allegation that's been rumoured uh, rumored around on social media. Really? I quite like that word, rumoured around. I'm going to keep that. <laughs> <laughs> rumoured around social media quite a bit about how, yeah, they were they were pushed in that direction. And, of course, it, it, it's actually quite a clever idea. <laughs> I've got to give it to him. Yeah, well, Farage recently was saying how the Conservative Party need to become more conservative so he said that yeah it, it's gone too far to the left <laughs> it needs to it needs to be more it needs to return to its base and obviously he's talking about like what uh, you're saying here about Richard Tice moving it towards a uh, small government um, deregulation type uh, platform because what do you think about some of the new policies of Liz Truss's government her so this idea of um, pr the energy price cap what do you think about that well, I, I, I was going to say I mean she's obviously very concerned to keep the uh, the power companies very happy isn't she and uh, they're, they're set to make 170 billion in windfall profits and she wants to make sure they, they get and keep that and all the rest of us can can borrow all this money to to to, to subsidize the cuts and uh, we're all paying for it it seems absolute madness and when you compare it what's happening in the eu where where they're actually imposing this huge windfall tax of 140 billion which seems perfectly fair perfectly reasonable and perfectly sensible you just can't can't believe that uh, and, and and don't forget of course that throughout the campaign she said she was not going to have any handouts and she was dead against the handouts and now that's exactly what she's doing the handouts are not even to be targeted so 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 the rich will benefit more than the poor um, it just seems absolutely, utterly crazy. But again, it's designed to please the, the right of the Tory party. And bearing in mind, a lot of these power companies do do donate to the Tory party. I was going to say, did she receive, uh, was it 100,000 donation from BP to her uh, campaign uh, yeah. directly? The wife, yeah, the wife of a former executive. I mean, that's corruption, isn't it? I mean, there's, there is no other word for it. Yes. If you're receiving campaign finances from BP and then you get into office and then say we're not going to have a windfall tax no matter how much fiscal sense it but makes. I, I'd, I'd love you to know? hear somebody I'd love to hear not a politician but I'd love to hear a regular voter defend that so you go mm -hmm. to you go every year every four year five years to the polling booth and you cast your vote and that's supposed to have power that's supposed to have power and somebody else comes along and they donate you know a hundred thousand pounds is is nothing for the prime minister you know mm. i don't know how much a regular tory mp costs but probably you know five or six thousand pounds which is buttons for you know a millionaire or a, or a corporation but they donate and they get legislation uh, according to whatever they want how is that democratic i was going to say your joke on last week's episode was awesome on that and going to the bank that i've told that to so many people about that idea of going to your bank manager and yes. <laughs> like honestly one of that's yeah everyone's loving that but it's so true as well because you literally you know they're they're a great investment and they're cheap there's mm. no getting away around that you get like i've said this thousand, like quite a few times on this channel i've said that the the russians have been clearly shown to be bunging mps off for 5k mm. and then you've got their ear that's nothing. I was going to say, that's what surprised me. There was a lot of fuss last week about it. It was revealed, I think, from America, wasn't it, that, that the Russians had spent 230, what was it, 230 million or something? It didn't seem an awful lot of money for the amount of um, influence they claim to have got. So I've got, I've got two things to add to that, Michael. So it was the Washington Post, and it was from a right. telegraph communication from the FBI. 300 million is what they've said. However, the hacking group, Anonymous, went and hacked into the central Russian bank and released a load of documents. And in some of those documents, it showed that actually they'd funneled $1.5 trillion oh. into Cypriot banks, which oh. means that once it's in Europe, that money can then be filtered out everywhere else. And it's, a, it's a, clearly a cleaning mechanism. So I think that $300 million, they've said, is sort of the tip of the iceberg as to how much right. actually has been pumped into our economies. And for Vladimir Putin, this is... This is genius. This is like one of the most evil Machiavellian ideas I've ever seen in terms of influencing politics. Just finance the sides that you want to back. Mm. You know, the sides that are going to do your bidding. The people that are going to be aligned with your theories. Nothing's happened. We've talked about the press not doing anything about sort of balanced views with the monarchy. They've done nothing, from what I can tell, with Russia. In my personal opinion, this is up there in terms of treason as... Guy Fawkes. Wasn't the conclusion of the Russia report, didn't they? They concluded that they had, in fact, interfered in the Scottish referendum. Yeah. They didn't look 
for evidence <laughs> over nope. Brexit and then use the fact that they didn't find any evidence which they didn't look for as as an argumentation as to oh it's fine <laughs> like basically the the conclusion was we're not really going to investigate it and there's a dead body in my house but i haven't looked for a murderer so there isn't a murder <laughs> yeah i mean can you can you imagine the well if if uh, concrete evidence was produced that the russians had actively interfered in the brexit campaign which let's be honest they probably did <laughs> like to well, not he... look because it's because it suits your narrative, because it because you're happy with the way it went, is uh, well, well, you use the word treasonous. I mean, it's yeah, uh, it's terrible. But it'd be, very, it'd be very difficult to hold anyone to account, isn't it? To find it enough proof, uh, I be very difficult. But but, um, even, but even, I mean, if you, but, even but even if you could hold something, like even if you had proof, if you had a, a bank transfer from Moscow to Boris Johnson's personal bank account. People would still say, "Well, yeah, but there's nothing really, like, you know. Exactly. You're, ju you're just, you're just a, a sore loser. Let it go. That, that's the well, that's the problem with the." With but the there's, another, there's another rumor that's kicking around on on social media. Conservative MP has claimed that MI6 approached Theresa May and said, "You need to rerun the Brexit referendum because of the level of interference." It makes perfect sense for Russia to interfere, and there's there is loads of evidence. There's a couple of things I would say that are quite strong but then you still got an element of debate. So 250K got given to DUP, which didn't have to be registered as to where it came from because of the legislation created during the Troubles. You didn't have to register. And I assume part of that was down to the fact during the Troubles in Ireland and Northern Ireland, that if you showed you were donating large amounts of money, you'd probably get whacked. So that was used. And then that 250K was then used to buy advertising in the Metro. And it was a full front page cover as to why you should be voting for Brexit. And you're going, that's not right. We also know that they've overspent. That's a fact. That's that's come out. We know that the University of Swansea and Edinburgh have come out and said, we've found thousands of bots being used to interfere in the election. And then one of the biggest things that, again, the media should have really pushed. Boris said there was no interference in November before he got elected. None. He said that twice. I've seen no evidence of interference. And yet the report comes out and goes, there was interference in the Scottish referendum. So yeah. you're like, you've lied to the public about our democracy. I would say that's as treasonous as Guy Fawkes. I I've never heard of a parallel. Literally, our country's been sold out for 5K a person. That's just nuts. But I think, you know, people are not that interested. Um, mm. Those of us involved, you know, to take an interest in things are, are, but the general public are not really very interested. It's like if you do a video on, as I've done, you do one on the, the Dido Harding's 37 billion or whatever, no one's really interested. Uh, and if you talk about tax evasion and talk about uh, money laundering, very, very, um, very little interest. I think uh, it, it's too remote from most people's lives. And so I think this whole, uh, you know, Putin and uh, corruption and so on and manipulating the uh, referendum it, it, it's something that's not going to go anywhere because there aren't enough people interested enough and that's why the newspapers don't bother with it very much it's not a big story for most people i guess one of the other problems is once he was in in, in power there's a lot of evidence to show that a lot of people don't want to know exactly. um like like but institutionally so you could go to the police and report it and they'll just divert you to your local mp and you're like no you're the police they've broken the law you need to investigate but but they won't. They'll just go, go to your MP and tell them what's happened. And it's like, but they've broken the law. How does that work? I've got evidence. There's loads of evidence. I can, I mean, you can read, you, we talked about the UK Russia report. You can go and look at the US Russia report. It's the same stuff. They cite Nigel Farage in the US report as a person of interest. The Mueller report cited Nigel Farage as a person of interest. Can, so Alex, like, can, Alex, can I just yeah, ask sorry. you, yeah, just one question. So if you go to the police to say my MP has been bribed, that they will say it will go to your MP and complain. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just so that's clear. <laughs> because I see, it's nuts, isn't it? They will, they do not want to know. Like, because I think there's this thing of, they don't want a police state. And that could, so that could happen quite quickly if the police start going around politi arresting politicians. And I think that's part of the reason why MI6, MI6 has come out and criticised. There was a, the, I think the head of MI6 in 2016 came out and said there's been huge Russian interference. Prior to Boris saying there was no interference. 
I think like, that, that in itself is like quite a serious thing, but the media just ignored it. And I, I get what you're saying, Michael. I think for a lot of people, it's a bit like, I can't compute this. Yeah, yeah. And I think for the police, they, they've got other things to worry about and it's complicated and it's going to take up a lot of time and resources and so on. It's the same with HMRC and anything complicated. They don't want to know. They've got easier cases to go after and catch or people. Prince Andrew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to investigate that. They're not investigating Epstein. They're not investigating Maxwell. I appreciate Epstein's dead. But they're investigating Maxwell in France, which is oh, interesting. They're... Yeah. Yeah, that's not a well-known fact, but the French police are investigating her. So you're a bit like, why aren't we investigating here? And of course, it's a bit too close again to the monarchy, which then goes back to what we were saying, you know, earlier about the right to free speech and protest. Mm -hmm. Like, us four on here right now saying what we're saying, does that mean we've just broken the law? I hope not. I don't I think anyone's well, saying so. one with the Republic, have they? I just said it hypothetically. <laughs> I think the other the other thing is with when you look at investigating election interference is you know no nobody thinks they've been swayed by nefarious means you know and fifty two percent of the electorate did vote for Brexit so when when you're sort of approaching kind of that you know the, the arguably larger portion of the electorate and sort of saying well you you know that's that's null and void now it, it's it's a hard argument to sell that, no matter how legitimate it is, because you sort of, you know, basically trying to persuade them that their their victory was nullified and that people that voted the same way that they did were swayed by bad actors. And that it's it's a hard argument to make. Hmm. But I, I think the, the, the point needs to be made that it shouldn't happen again. So hmm. there should be mechanisms put in place to protect democracy so yeah as you said you know people and also a lot of you know was it six almost seven years has passed since the referendum so yeah it's 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 not going to be overturned it's not going to be but it is important that we understand okay this is why it happened this is how it happened uh this was who was involved and this needs to be stopped and this should not happen again for the record i was completely against the idea of a referendum because you were, you were asking people to vote on something that they had no understanding of. This okay. is the job of politicians. Politicians, have, they're paid massive salaries to make mm. these decisions. And it, the leaving the EU should, have not, should not have been uh, given to the people. Because obviously they didn't, they didn't understand. One, the, you know, the, everyone has heard this story before, but the, the very first, the, the top Google search after... The referendum was what is the eu i mean here's uh, hypothetical i mean i i do i do generally agree with you i think that the eu should not you know brexit should not have gone to a referendum say with scottish independence would it be appropriate for the for holyrood to declare independence without a referendum no i would say mm. no as well it's just it's just re i agree that referendums are a bad idea but there no, are no, times the, the, where no, no, required. The, the, yeah, it's not that. It's not that I, I, I think referendums are a bad idea. I think the the approach when it came to Brexit was a very bad idea because, for example, if you look at Switzerland, who have referendums all the time, what they do is they they make sure that um the, the public are informed in a very in as neutral and independent way as possible. And if there is some sort of problem, if there's any problem with that with that vote, it's cancelled. It's null and void, and they have another referendum. Uh, right. That that should be the approach that there's, you know, the way the referendum, I think the Brexit referendum should have gone is if there was a referendum was the politicians don't get involved at all. You don't have politicians saying you, you should vote this way or that way. They should be completely neutral on it. Um, and the information should be presented by an independent body. This is what leaving the EU will do. This is why this is the. The, the benefits of leaving, the benefits of remaining, and it should have been provided in as neutral way as possible. And you shouldn't have had people like Nigel Farage on TV talking about it. You shouldn't have had... Now, maybe that was impossible, but in the end, you had somebody saying everything is going to be wonderful. They weren't held to account. They were not countered on that by the media. Mm. And on the other side, you had a bunch of bore, boring politicians who were saying, yeah, you, let's just maintain the status quo. Mm. It was an absolute disaster. And then I people, think it, people it, didn't know what they voted for. The problem really was that it was such a complicated uh, uh, question. It was so, so intensely complicated after 45 years of membership. And it was all boiled down to taking back control, take back control, stop um, bureaus, uh, Brussels bureaucrats telling us what to do. And people just fell for that. 
And it was absolutely madness. And on, on top of that, it, it should certainly have been at least a, a 60, 60, 40 split minimum before it would be carried. To, to, to carry such an important vote on 42, 58 is... I'd say if, if you're going to run this again, I think, you know, if you were to go back in time, because the trouble was, is you had Remain, which was, you know, the, the Maastricht Treaty and was very codified and understood. And then you had Leave, which was this huge nebulous collection of different ideas. You know, they should have done one of two things. They should have specifically laid out the nature of agreement they were type that aimed to seek beforehand. Yep. Or, the, or they should have said from the go, this will be a, a two-part referendum on the concept of Leave and then on, on the nature of an agreement. When they signed the Good Friday Agreement, they had the text of the Good Friday Agreement in the ballot box on both sides of the border. So people were able to give actual informed consent. Mm. And and we, we lacked that with Brexit. Yeah, completely. It was a buffet. Mm. Pick and choose whatever you want and you'll, you'll get it. You want instant economic success, you'll have that. You still want free movement, you can have that. I can, I, I can show you all the clips of all these people promising this stuff. Like, and they're all quite prominent. It's just that Nigel Farage was the most. But uh, the, there is one issue I'd have. The Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, definitely said, leave means leave. We're out. And that's, that's where I come up with the issue, because I'm like, well, that's pretty clear. And it's from someone with high levels of authority. Now, I think he actually said that, not because he thought it meant leave, but because he wanted to scare everyone into not leaving. I think that was the purpose of it. But of course, now I could turn around and go, well, the PM said that's the choice. It's pretty clear to me we'll be completely out. Just because the Prime Minister said that doesn't help because Nigel Farage was saying something else. Daniel Hannan was saying something else. David Davis was like, going, only upsides, no downsides to Brexit. It's going to be fabulous, like the best thing ever. Love streets of gold, lollipop lanes, trees made of money. It'll be the best thing that's isn't ever it, happened. Isn't, really. isn't it great that after 2016, we never heard of David Davis ever again because he was mm. so wrong? Brexit oh, no, benefit. no. Yeah, he became a Brexit minister. Yes, yes. <laughs> and he's still in the House of Commons. Uh. Official unicorn hunter. <laughs> <laughs> that would make oh, a God. wonderful T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> that would make a really good... You know the Bugs Bunny cartoon? I'm hunting wabbits. <laughs> They, uh, you, I had listened to an interview with, you know, led by donkeys, and they were saying that they, because they, they had an agreement, they were they were only going to target the politicians, not not the voters. But they said they had a photo of all these Brexiteers that went on a march, and then they stayed at a Weatherspoons called the Unicorn, <laughs> and they had this photo out of all their British flags, and leave, leave means leave signs out the front of the Unicorn, and they had this whole debate about whether or not they were going to use this photo. Um, they didn't in the end, but it was very funny. But what really swung the uh, the referendum was Boris Johnson, wasn't it? I mean, just he was so dominant and uh, so popular amongst people who weren't interested or bothered with politics. Yeah, but he's funny, isn't he? I'll go to the pub with exactly, him. Yes. He seems like a right lad. He was good on uh, Have I Got News For You. Do, do, you think, do you think if it had been the other way around, if Cameron had been leave and Johnson had been remain, the vote would have gone the other way? Yes. That could have Probably. happened as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say whichever way Johnson had gone would have, would, would have swung it because he was just so, so dominant, so, so powerful. Just people love him. They still do. I mean, look at, look at what, what's happened. The utter disaster of his uh, premiership and still millions of people. Look at all those, those Tory voters saying, oh, I'd bring back Boris if I could. And, and dishonesty, forget it. Lying, forget it. He, he got all the big calls right, remember? That's that. right, he did. I forgot that. <laughs> I don't know which ones they're talking about, but he got all yeah. of them right, yeah. 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 They keep talking about the vaccine, but I'm always like, I think that was already in place. I think that was ready. That was one of the few things that was ready to go. And I think any prime minister would be in charge. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any person that'd be in charge, that would have happened, whatever happened. Well, and of course, it... um, he, he, he got Brexit done, didn't he? Brexit. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're not talking it about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the head of the, the UK medicines regulator said pretty emphatically at the time that the vaccine was, um, you know, confer, you know, approved for the UK mm. market. She said, we're still under EU rules. We're still within the withdrawal period. We did this working with our European colleagues. It, we, we have not done this first as a result of Brexit, period. Mm. 
but they're still trumpeting. Rhys Mogg always does it, you know, says, oh, you know, rah, 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 Brexit, vaccine, whatever. You know, they're not. <laughs> we didn't we didn't get the vaccine out faster because of Brexit. Hmm. So, so it's two things. First of all, it wasn't, as you said, it wasn't because of Brexit. The, the head of the medical authority in the UK said, no, it's nothing to do with Brexit. Uh, it's nothing, you know, to, it's nothing to do with leaving the EU. And and second, within a few months, the EU had caught up. Yes. And a yeah. number of EU countries had had rolled out the vaccine faster. So, you know, mm-hmm. um, even Ireland, I think, at one stage had had uh, had a, a faster roll. But but then it came to okay, well, what is the what is the barometer you're using? Is it at the beginning, or in the middle, or at the end? You know, and then you know, it's like if you're running a race, you say. And I and I hate this idea that it's a race that it was a yeah you know we're we're beating other countries I hated this thing because it's you know we we all have to protect we, you know until everyone's protected none of us are protected but it was this idea that yeah, it's a race and well then if you're if you're running a you know a marathon and after the first third of the way you're leading hmm. and then at the second third you're behind. And then at the end, you're behind. Is that a victory? I hate the idea of that. Yes. Yeah, speaking of finishes. <laughs> speaking of finishes, we're done. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. When you guys go on to YouTube, yeah. How long do you spend prepping? What do you mean by on to YouTube? Like to, uh, to so record. when you're doing a recording, making a video. Oh, it yeah. takes me ages. I mean, I, I'm try. I'm trying to just sort of get like a, a, a sort of almost agreed upon setup so i can just go bish bash bosh set it up record um but i i'm always tweaking stuff and changing things so it it, it does take me a while to set up and, and get the lighting right because I, I i like a well-lit shot you know i, I, I quite like it to look i'm actually good. noticing that me and track record simon are well lit and everything else and you two i've got an impression you just Toodle on, switch on your camera, and you still get thousands upon thousands of views. <laughs> so well, this is where we've gone wrong. We just don't make any. Like, well, I can't. I can't say you don't make any effort because obviously I can see that you guys are all, yo, thumbed up. You know. <laughs> well, I do. Have you got a desk or anything set up? Like I have where I am now. Yes, I have where I'm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you ever thought of pulling out and then showing that? Pusil veneer, like oak desk. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> yeah. it actually, it actually works quite well. It, you know, boxes <laughs> of stuff, and uh, you know, I don't know if you guys, you guys can. Oh, is that Ron? Oh, Ron oh, that's a Ron's hat. Oh. <laughs> what is? Where does the name Ron Venti come from? Is that a? Sir Ron Venti, Sir <laughs> Sir Ron Venti, Sir. Sir, if you so, we're trying to think of Get it, you know, it right. <laughs> you know, so, sovereignty, sovereignty, uh, Sir Ron Venti. Okay, that's been a while. Okay, so, I, I hate the idea of that. Yes, yeah, uh, speaking of finishes, <laughs> speaking of finishes, we're done. Oh. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> that's the reaction we want, Michael. Oh, oh, what? That went by quickly. I was what just was uh, with free speech. I think you're you're all aware of that. The only thing you can't say is that you want to kill someone, uh, okay. or you want someone dead. Um, you know, pity, pity, pity. <laughs> <laughs> Edit this <Right>. out. <laughs> I don't have I drastically misunderstood what kind of podcast this is. <laughs> it's actually like the the Al Qaeda podcast. <laughs>